Of course, we also have major developments in science. Uh, evolution and natural selection are going are, are gonna to first be introduced as, as scientific ideas here. Um, Darwin, uh, in his work, uh, suggesting that people, they're not well, people and all living things, evolve over time, suggests that there is no great plan to history, that there is just some sort of kind of uh, uh, stimulus and response as opposed to some big mapped out scheme. Uh, it suggests it's just a random uh, process. At first, he's opposed by, by clergy and educators, but pretty soon most educated people begin to accept Darwin, even religious people. Uh, Protestant ministers particularly will simply adopt their religious doctrine to, to fit in to accommodate uh, Darwin's work. The, the significant pushback against Darwin actually won't come for a few decades. Originally, uh, most church uh, folks accepted it. But then there's also this something new happening here, an urban-rural split. City people are beginning to see themselves differently than country folk and vice versa. They're beginning to develop different values and different attitudes uh, towards all sorts of different issues. Uh, and this split is going to become incredibly important as we move forward into the 20th century here. Darwin will be adapted into something that we call social Darwinism. Uh, now, Darwin hated social Darwinism, and he said it was nonsense. But social Darwinism is, is the idea that the reason why a rich person is rich is because he is more evolved. He is better than the poor people, and the poor people are less evolved. Now, Darwin points out this isn't how evolution works. Evolution is largely random happenstance that only plays out over hundreds, if not thousands, of generations. It doesn't play out within the course of one person's lifetime. But Darwinism was embraced by the wealthy as a justification of why they were rich and powerful and why the poor were not. William James, Charles Pierce, and John Dewey will develop a, that says other three guys, will develop a uniquely American philosophy. Uh, actually, it's the two guys, it's two of those guys over there on the uh, right. Will develop a fairly uniquely American philosophy called pragmatism, uh, which basically says that we should re reject tradition and religion and replace it with scientific inquiry, that everything essentially can be solved by science. Socialists like Edward Ross and Lester Frank Ward, uh, he, Ward is the guy with the sideburns, will apply science to political and social problems. They'll say we can use science to solve the problems of poverty in the city or crime, things like that. Frederick Jackson Turner and Charles Beard, who we've already talked about, uh, we talked about Turner, he's the closing of the, the, the frontier guy, will claim that economic factors, not spiritual ideas, have shaped history. They'll offer an economic explanation of history. I'm sorry, the guy on the bottom right there is uh, Dewey. Dewey will push a democratic, flexible schooling over memorization. He says sitting kids down and making them memorize a bunch of facts doesn't teach them anything. Uh, we have to actually teach them how to think. And he will become a major pioneer in how we think about education. Darwin's work inspired a boom in anthropology and science uh, uh, generally. And also um, uh, an ex a desire to explore other cultures. And there will be a great fascination with India in particular during this time. By 1900, 31 out of 45 states have made it a law that, you ha that children have to go to school. Rural areas, of course, lag behind as they either don't have these laws or the enforcement is, is difficult to, uh, to accomplish. The South uh, still refused to educate blacks in many cases, uh, but we do begin to have women or girls, I should say, in school. Uh, we've talked about attempts to civilize Native Americans by forcing them to go to school, and so that's going on as well. By the 1870s, reformers recruit Native American kids to go to Hampton, a black college. And in 1879, the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Pennsylvania opens, uh, but that school eventually fails due to corruption by the people administering it. The Morrill Land Grant of 1862 leads to a massive expansion of the number of universities in the, sta in, in the, in the nation. Sixty-nine universities will open up during this post-Civil War period. One of the sources is philanthropists, the wealthy people, the Carnegies of the world, who pour money into private schools. And if you think about schools like Duke, Stanford, Tulane, um, these are all named after the rich people who funded them. Uh, and so that's one source of school. Of course, the other is the land-grant universities. Um, these were universities that were created by the Morrill Act that said uh, the federal government's going to put aside land to fund schools. Land-grant universities were required by law to be agricultural and mechanical universities and, and were committed to practical research as opposed to just a, a more rounded liberal arts education. Research and development at the universities fueled the economic boom as well. So a lot of science and technology that's being developed at the university will, will, will grow the economy. And private companies began to figure this out and do their own research and development. 
MIT is founded in 1865 and Johns Hopkins is founded in 1876. The Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research and the Carnegie Institute, two more examples of universities funded by the rich people of the day. And by 1900, even the oldest, most established universities are working closely alongside with American corporations uh, to develop uh, technology um, uh, for those corporations. Medicine. The idea that symptoms were caused by diseases as opposed to being a disease themselves is going to begin to gain popularity during this time. We're also going to see the development of the x-ray and the microscope uh, to improve diagnosis, or the improvement, I should say, of the microscope. We can now diagnose successfully typhoid and dysentery, um, and pharmacology begins to create medicines to combat these uh, uh, problems. Aspirin is developed in 1899 as a kind of an all-purpose pain reliever, and we actually have chemotherapy developed right around the turn of the century as well. Blood transfusions are created in 1906 by George Kreil, and by 1900, the germ theory is accepted, the idea that, uh, that some germ or bacteria gets into your body and causes an infection, and that's why you're sick. Factors that lead to disease begin to be cataloged. We begin to write down, you know, science, uh, <laughs> symptoms of diseases and stuff. Uh, ideas like general health and preventative, preventative medicine, the link between diet, nutrition, genetics, and health are beginning to be understood. Of course, as we understand germ theory, we adopt sterilization. We begin to wear gloves, wear masks, and to make medicine safer. And soon, American doctors are among the best in the world, and foreign students will become, begin to come to America to study. This will lead generally to a decline in the death rate uh, in America. Public high schools also began accepting women, but few colleges did. By 1865, there's only three colleges that accept women. Um, Midwestern land-grant colleges, though, begin to accept women, uh, plus Cornell and Wesleyan. More important to women were all-girl colleges like Mount Holyoke, founded in Massachusetts in 1836 as a female seminary to train up uh, 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 religious folks. In the 1880s, um, it becomes a full college, though. At that, that same time, in the 1880s, Sir Wellesley, Smith, Bryn Mawr, and Goucher uh, all are open up as women's colleges. Columbia opens up a woman's auxiliary, Barnard, uh, which is just for women. The boys go to Columbia, the women uh, go, to, go to Barnard. Uh, Harvard opens up Radcliffe in the same way. Colleges, uh, the women's colleges are taught and run mostly by unmarried women. Uh, most college graduates who are women, actually, never marry. Uh, only about 25% do. And this will create a vital intellectual community of intelligent, educated women who all know each other, and that's going to be important for the women's movement going forward here.